Um, so the, the third half hour session, I'm going to talk about uh, the Affordable Care Act, which uh, is known as ACA, in the acronym, or Obamacare. Um, if you look at like, some materials I have in the um, beginning with, with my just short resume, that's my materials. And if you look at page four, um, my materials that I've used have come from uh, three sources. I've, do, I've done one graph myself, but the primary sources are from the training materials of the California Department of Social Services, the State Hearings Division, because there are the, the people around the division that's charged with um, figuring these things out when uh, the appeals happen. And the, the second set is on page 16, where you see that the National Health Law Program, um, and the page 2 of uh, page 17, uh, has their addresses. Uh, they have some excellent resource materials on their website, uh, and they had no problem with sharing their resources. Um, I, page 18 has acronyms, and so sometimes, um, if I use an acronym or hear an acronym, these are kind of the most common acronyms that uh, you will see in the uh, you know in, in, in what we're doing. Uh, the in California, Medi-Cal is in the, and the Affordable Care Act is administered by Cover California, and so you'll see references to the Cover California website. If you want to apply for Medi-Cal uh, or private insurance, that is the portal. Uh, which you would apply. Um, legal authorities, uh, the law is, is brand new right now. Um, there really hasn't been that much action, as far as I can tell, other than these major lawsuits trying to overturn the law. Uh, page 20, uh, again from the National Health Law Project, gives you some basic citations to, um, to the law uh, and where you can, you can find it. But it's, it's tough researching it just by looking at the law. Um, that's why it's really nice to have these, uh, these web sites, particularly National Health Law Project, uh, which is, is quite a, a good portal to, to find information. So the, the Affordable Care Act had this comprehensive federal legislation with two primary purposes. The first purpose is to regulate private health insurance and to create private exchanges, kind of marketplaces, where an individual can shop and compare insurance plans. Now these were supposed to be administered by the states, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Only about half the states now are, are doing it, and the federal government has been forced to create exchanges or portals for the various, for about half the other states. The second purpose of the ACA is to expand national Medicaid eligibility in California is known as Medi-Cal. Federally, the program is Medicaid. And as I said before, it's under Title 19 of the, uh, the Social Security Act. Um, the Medicaid expansion is kind of like a public option for the poor. Uh, when the legislation was being discussed and advocated from multiple sides, many people felt and still feel that a, a Medicare for all or a public option like that would be very helpful and would uh, serve people better than the system we have. That was not to be, but we do have the Medicaid expansion, which again is like a public option for the poor. The, um, the Affordable Care Act mandates, mandates individual coverage and is enforced and paid through taxes. And so uh, IRS is going to have uh, uh, now uh, provisions where they will be asking if you're covered. And if you're not covered, then you pay a penalty uh, for not being covered. Right now, the penalties aren't that great. It depends on your income. Uh, but they will go up in the years. And under the uh, ACA, federal government provides public and private subsidies to the total mix in order to enable affordable and quality health care benefits to millions of Americans. Now, I want to direct your attention to page 8. There's a handout that's qualified health plan services provided, and I think this is the core 
And this is what people need to understand, why this is such monumental legislation. And the all plans now under the Affordable Care Act have to provide certain essential services. And Obama got tripped up by this because he said if you have if you like your insurance now, you can keep your insurance. And that's not entirely true because certain insurance didn't have these quality products and benefits as part of their plans, so that the insurance companies couldn't provide them and people were cut off and they had to reapply again for insurance. And But ultimately, um, these are great benefits. Uh, the 10 categories of essential health benefits include emergency, hospitalization, maternity, mental health, substance use, prescription drugs, uh, pediatric services, and then you have the coverage of children up to 26 years of age who can qualify for their parents medical insurance plans. Um, so there are some very significant quality <coughs> benefits. The, the other thing that um, the policies are required to provide is that there, um, there can't be a limit. So that before what would happen is people would go into a hospital and they'd end up with hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars worth of bills and end up in bankruptcy. My understanding is that that's no longer possible. So uh, that the there's no more limits. Uh, so this is going to cost a lot of money, and that's why there are taxes that are being paid by employers and employees, and uh, a lot of money had to be put into the mix uh, to enable this program. In general, it does not apply to individuals already covered through group health plans and individuals who are qualified for other insurance like SSI or Medicare. Those are considered to already meet the standards. Um, quick question, yeah. Does this apply to HSA compatible plans too? I don't know what the HSA compatible plans. Um, uh, health savings accounts? Okay. And, and the health savings accounts is a different area and it's offered through employers which enable basically an employer makes a certain a defined contribution to a uh, that's the SSA. Well, I don't want to get into yeah, that right now. Yeah, that's um, not that at all. direct your attention to page eleven, qualified health plan eligibility requirements. Um, you have to be a citizen or a non citizen who is lawfully present. You have to be a California resident in order to participate in the exchange uh, and Medi Cal. Uh, and then there's some other uh, children are also eligible, but again, there's certain requirements um, that are set forth on page 12 of your um, of your uh, materials. And I'm, I'm not going to get into those. I'm just going to point them out. The, the Affordable Care Act is completely income based, so there's no assets test, and if you the, the formula is modified adjustable gross income as generally defined by U.S. tax law. And this would be income of the tax household, including claim dependents. So if someone is, a parent is claiming an adult child as their dependent on their tax form because they supply one half or more, then if the adult child tries to apply for benefits on the Affordable Care Act, they will be linked to the household income, and they will not be able to apply separately to, uh, to the, uh, the ACA. The boundary, there's a boundary between up to 138% of the federal poverty level is Medi-Cal or Medicaid. I think some states are 133%. The states have a little bit of leeway as to um, what they what percentage? Page two of your materials uh, gives you an idea, uh, and it's from another website, uh, Health Consumer Alliance. But it shows, like for one person, that's sixteen thousand one hundred five dollars a year, and thirteen forty two a month. Two people, slightly higher, etc. So that gives you an idea uh, as to. Uh, 
what 138 percent of the federal poverty level, poverty level is. If someone's over the 138 percent, they're in the private insurance marketplace. Uh, but the lower one's income, the higher the subsidy. There's a number of financial assistance programs, and those are referred to on page 7 of your materials. And there are the tax credits, advanced payments of premium tax, there's the cost sharing subsidies, and then there's the MAGI based Medi-Cal assistance. Now MAGI again is one of those key things, and I think I actually may have missed, um, I'll point it out later, but it's, it means modified adjusted gross income. And again, that's what we're looking at under U.S. tax code. The idea was to try to simplify the system so that you wouldn't have heavy administrative costs. And when they did that was by looking at people's tax returns. A lot of people don't have tax returns, then they're going to need to construct that and even make estimates. And I think this is where a lot of the, uh, the problems are going to be, is, is trying to figure out what is the person's income, because you're supposed to estimate. Uh, if you're a kind of, you're a temporary worker, you know, how are you supposed to estimate that? Probably look at the previous years, but if you were sick in the previous year and you're going to be working now, again, it's, it's, this is where uh, the difficulties are going to lie, is trying to figure out someone's income. Um, there are initial and annual open enrollment periods for the program, similar to Medicare, which I described earlier. Um, and page 13 of your materials has a, um, give you some idea of the initial en enrollment, which has already occurred. Um, I think the Obama administration may have extended it a little bit, in, or kind of, you know, liberalized the regulations when someone had actually applied. Um, and then the annual enrollment uh, begins uh, October 15th through December 7th this year. Um, but if someone misses the boat, uh, unless they have a special enrollment exemption, of which there are many, they have to wait to apply for the benefits. The idea is everyone, they don't want someone who's not covered to all of a sudden get sick and be hospitalized and say, oh yeah, I'd love to apply for this program. So then that's the way that the private insurance and Medicare is based, is they have initial enrollments and then open enrollment and then that's exemptions, so exceptions. Page 15 of the materials indicate what, and there are a lot of special enrollments. Someone's uh, divorce, um, you lose your, or first one, you lose your MEC, minimal, minimum essential coverage in some way, shape, or manner. You get, you know, there's just a lot. You gain citizenship, you're newly eligible, uh, you're changing eligibility. Um, there seems to be a lot of you know, loopholes for this. Yes? The last one, Native American, Indian? There's an Indian. Um, good question. Uh, yes, I would assume. Uh, because there are different rules that apply to Native Americans and different benefit programs. Um, the uh, appeals procedures uh, are not in the hand, well actually I did give you a handout of appeals procedures which is, um, it's appeals and it's from the California Department of Social Services. Um, they're getting ready, I, I think we're hearing some cases, but it's the same judges who do the Medi-Cal are also going to hear the appeals. Um, the Covered California would be the respondent and so it's, it's going to be an interesting um, mix that appears in front of the judges uh, as they have to confront some of these issues. Um, there is an all-county letter which explains the appeals process. These are uh, letters which the Department of Health Services in California issued for clarification to the counties on how they're supposed to administer the program. And all-county letter 2014-14, uh, which is noted at the very top of this handout, is what apparently I've not looked at it, which apparently describes it. Um, the, what, what's interesting, uh, some anecdotal kind of stories, um, is you have individuals that are being encouraged to apply through the exchanges. And you have the insurance companies that are now trying to set up the criteria and for the exchanges and to be able to provide all of these quality health products that are mandated. And the anecdotal stories seem to suggest 
that the insurance companies may be uh, uh, discouraging people from applying through the exchanges, uh, either by making it complicated or by not having enough providers who are available. And I myself have talked to a doctor who is trying to get information as how they can get into these networks because it's still the you know the dust still has not settled. But the idea now is for private insurance to, to uh, they would probably make more money if people enroll in their programs outside of the exchanges rather than through the exchanges themselves. So again, that's anecdotal evidence that, that I have, uh, I've heard. Um, there's a whole lot of politics um, surrounding the, uh, the ACA. Um, there's been uh, some glitches, you know, which the uh, media was very well able to point out. And then there have been obstacles put up by uh, organized opposition. In spite of these obstacles, the law is a remarkable success already. Um, I, I mean, I've already described to you what the benefits are now that it, insurance companies and Medicaid has to provide. Um, there, there will be an issue as to whether or not there's enough doctors to treat all these new Medi-Cal recipients, whether there's enough health care providers, whether the state's paying enough. The state of California has a very low reimbursement rate for providers, and they've actually reduced the rates uh, during our recession. And now there's pressure mounting that the state actually increased the reimbursement rate so that the doctors who will actually take Medi-Cal, they don't seem to mind taking Medicare recipients, but there's a big problem finding doctors who take Medi-Cal. Um, in support of the idea that this is a tremendously successful program, um, I would like to cite a magazine which I just started reading again, I haven't read in many years, to the Rolling Stone. <laughs> and um, the, the current issue actually is today's date, April 24th, and it's got a picture of uh, Julia Louise Dreyfus on the cover. I'm not going to, I didn't uh, present that, but <laughs> and, and then she's kind of without any clothes on. Um, but it, it, there's an article here um, about Obamacare, and it says it's working. And um, it really is remarkable. Uh, and what the, again, I'm quoting from the article, and it seems to be consistent with the information that we're getting, and uh, it seems like it's a fairly well researched article. It says the president's health care law has insured far more people outside the private insurance exchanges, upward of 10 million. And that's beginning with 1 million children with pre existing conditions. I think that was the first thing that, that, uh, that they did. Uh, it's provided um, 3 million young adults who have secured coverage on their parents' health plans. That's you know, up to age 26, they've gotten coverage. More than 4.5 million poor Americans have already gained coverage, and I suspect that that number is going to continue to grow. Um, and then there's outreach efforts that have brought nearly 2 million very poor Americans to sign up for Medicaid in the individual states. So again, there's the traditional and the new and the uh, expanded Medi-Cal. But um, there is no, it's important to, to just, there is no um, uh, enrollment periods for Medicaid. Unlike the private insurance, a person can apply for Medicaid at any time. Now, you can't apply for Medicare at any time, right? There's just the initial open and special enrollment. But Medicaid, there is no uh, limitation on when you can apply. So I anticipate there's still going to be a lot more uh, people who are applying. Um, two more points this article makes, and they make, they make a lot of interesting points. An estimated 120 million Americans with a pre-existing condition cannot be denied coverage. So, again, that is part of the, of the mix of the Affordable Care Act, um, which means that people don't have to stay tethered to their employers, for example. And that's why a lot of people have already left their employment, because they, can, they, were, they couldn't get it because of a pre-existing condition. And now, insurance companies are no longer able to deny coverage. So people have the flexibility to leave their employer 
for uh, not losing uh, quality health care. Um, the, the second, another interesting point is, and again I'm quoting from the article, since the bill's passage in 2010, the growth in health care spending has dialed down to just 1.3 percent, less than one-third the average since 1965. So as, as you recall, the Spir rising spiraling cost of health care has been a major issue for many years. And since its passage, it's been cut to one third. And I, I suppose the insurance companies have finally, in, in order to conform, they've had to do some uh, changes. One of the provisions that I, I don't have any citation for, but one which I recall is that insurance companies have to spend 80% of the, of the revenues toward health care. And so that leaves a 20% margin for profits and advertising. Um, by comparison, Medicare, I think, spends 3% administrative costs. Uh, so that they've, they're not able to take, they can only take a certain amount. Uh, they have to put the rest back into coverage. And that's going to be uh, a driving factor in reducing the uh, the, the costs of the program. So, it, getting um, expanding Medicaid uh, is left largely to the individual states, um, and that's based on the U.S. Supreme Court ruling in June 2012 of NFIB versus Sebelius, or the National Federation of Independent Businesses versus Sebelius. It's easily uh, Googleable. Um, the law had couple provisions that were questioned. One was the individual mandate, where people have to have coverage or you pay a penalty. And the, um, the second provision was that the federal government required states to expand their Medicaid programs uh, to uh, and offer 100% funding. But the penalty was that they didn't expand, then they would lose their other Medicaid funding. Now, in the U.S. Supreme Court decision, they upheld it by a five to four decision. They upheld the individual mandate, which is what people thought they would not uphold it. But they said the states don't have to accept expanded Medicaid, and the federal government does not have, uh, cannot withhold Medicaid monies to the states. So about half the states now uh, are promoting Medicaid in their states, and half are not. And um, I myself think that it's a, um, a, uh, a mistake for the states not to do it, and I, you know, it, it, it kind of boggles my mind. Uh, the Rolling Stone article says at least 17 states have passed laws to restrict ACA navigators, professionals paid to help uninsured Americans in, enroll in suitable coverage. So they're discouraging people to sign up for the ACA which again is kind of mind-boggling that where they're getting 100% financing, you know, from the feds, and yet for uh, a principal, they're they're not doing that. Um, so um, it's left largely to the states. Proactive states like California and New York are doing very well. Um, there's something that uh, I think what what uh, the Rolling Stone article points out that California has. Uh, enrolled one third of its uninsured population in Medicaid. Texas has enrolled one tenth uh, in, uh, in probably the traditional Medicaid. So the nuts and bolts: traditional versus expanded Medi-Cal. Um, if you look at page three of the materials, this is a, uh, a chart that I have prepared. There's, there's one mistake, and I apologize. In the right-hand column, third one down. Under expanded Medi-Cal, it's linked by household, and it should be modified, not maximum, adjusted gross income, or, or magic. But let's go down. So you have the left-hand column now is traditional Medi-Cal, and then the right-hand is expanded Medi-Cal. Um, traditional Medi-Cal is a poverty level program. There's still an assets test. Um, but expanded Medi-Cal is a poverty income program, which again is based by this MAGI formula, modified adjusted gross income of 138% or less. And we have the chart just before that, page two, which describes what 138% is. So the traditional Medicare, uh, Medi-Cal is linked by SSI coverage, 
You can be age 65 or be disabled and poor. Resource limitation, $2,000 individual, uh, $3,000 family or couple. Um, no assets test in the expanded Medi-Cal program. Uh, income under traditional Medi-Cal, monthly income which exceeds a maintenance need, and I, I couldn't find the maintenance need chart, so there's no chart, but it's about $600 a month. It hasn't changed in 30 years. I think if you're aged and disabled, it may be $850 or something. So any income you have over that, you pay a deductible in order to get Medi-Cal. So if your income is $1,000 a month, um, if, the, if they, and I don't, I don't know the difference between the $600 maintenance need and the $850 for aged and disabled, but assuming it's $850, um, you're still going to pay $150 a month deductible, which in order to get Medi-Cal. Now, that's about, that's, you don't have to pay it every month like an insurance program, but when you have a need for services, you're in the hospital, you have some expensive test like an MRI or something, you know, then in order to get Medi-Cal to cover you on the traditional Medi-Cal, then you have to pay this deductible to the provider. And then the provider takes um, a Medi-Cal payment of whatever the amount is, you know, plus the, the share of cost. Um, again, under the, the new um, expanded Medi-Cal, uh, that would not likely be the case. Um, the, one of the, the primary differences between traditional and expanded Medi-Cal is that there's eligibility for in-home support services for people that need someone to come into their homes, uh, IHSS, uh, ten, used to be known as attendant care services, and help do them shopping, cooking, cleaning, there, there's eligibility for uh, under the medically needy category, which is either they're found disabled either through SSI or through Medi-Cal, but there is no eligibility for in-home support services under the expanded Medi-Cal, which kind of makes sense uh, because the only in-home support services is based on a severe disability requiring you know, in-home support services. Um, citizenship residency requirements are essentially the same under both programs. Um, you still have to be a California resident to get Medi-Cal. Uh, and then the, the, the final one is there's emergency Medi-Cal for undocumented uh, immigrants uh, under the uh, traditional Medi-Cal. I don't believe there's emergency Medi-Cal uh, under the Affordable Care Act. It was a big political issue where they wanted to, you know, Congress, there's no way they were going to pass any legislation that was going to provide um, medical care for illegal aliens. So um, in California, people that are, uh, have emergency hospitalization in Highland, for example, um, can apply for Medi-Cal even though they're undocumented. And if they're found disabled, then Medi-Cal will reimburse Highland Hospital for those services. Um, are there any questions? We're getting close to the 30 minutes. Any questions that anyone um, has? It's a kind of a mind-boggling uh, array of different uh, information. Uh, I think it's the greatest, one of the greatest programs that we've been passed by Congress since uh, Medicare and Medicaid originally, um, and I think ultimately it's going to really make a big difference. Uh, yes, Dr. Uh, undocumented, uninsured individuals. Yes. I mean, there's still going to need treatment. What happens if they are not covered? Well, then we all end up paying for it because they end up going to uh, emergency rooms are required to treat whoever walks in the door. So this will mean that we pay more taxes. And it was a reason, one of the primary driving forces is that more people would be insured. But it's essentially going to be the same but at a, a, a much less rate since theoretically many more people are going to be eligible for Medi-Cal. Uh, one last question. In the estate planning context, I read the situation where people of rather substantial assets in planning for adult disabled children want to do special needs trusts. Mm -hmm. And often they justify it on the grounds that they're not insurable. Doesn't Obamacare really eliminate the need in that situation? That's because great. they should be able to get It's it. a great question uh, to which um, I don't know the answer. It, it, theoretically, it should. Um, because they just look at the income of the household again. So if the adult child is being claimed as a dependent, 
then their, that adult child's level of income is going to be fixed by the family income. Well, but if there's enough, if there's plenty of assets and income, they can simply buy insurance, right? Well, they could, but again, there's no assets test. So again, that, that's a, it's a different area, as is the long-term care, estate planning, uh, which is uh, fortunately outside the scope of what I have to know. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.